Hello, my name is Ryan Anderson. I am an ATP and a CFI for airplane, instrument, and multi-engine aircraft. In this video, I am going to discuss your complex endorsement. Many pilots pursue their complex ratings shortly following the achievement of their private pilot license. What exactly is a complex aircraft? A complex aircraft must have retractable landing gear, a variable pitch propeller, and operable wing flaps. It does not have to be high performance or over 200 horsepower. That is a separate endorsement altogether. The complex rating is not a test so much as it is training where you will receive an endorsement from an instructor that will allow you to fly this type of aircraft. The most crucial part of the endorsement would be learning the proper operation of the landing gear. Mostly learning to always remember to extend it before landing. A very crucial part of this is the emergency gear extension. Every aircraft has some type of emergency gear extension in the case that the main extension method fails. There are many different types of landing gear and how they operate ranging from manual extension like the earlier Mooney models, hydraulic, electric, electrically activated and hydraulically actuated. Some use electricity simply to open valves for the engine driven hydraulics to exercise the gear. My old Aztec had a hydraulic pump on the left engine that would supply the hydraulic pressure for the landing gear by means of controls on the pedestal. In the case of an emergency, there was a standpipe in the hydraulic reservoir that retained hydraulic fluid in case of a hydraulic fluid loss in the main reservoir. The fluid that remained in the standpipe could be used to drop the gear by using a hand pump also located on the main pedestal. If all else failed, there was a CO2 bottle that could be activated in order to have one last option to get the gear down by blowing the gear down using the pressure from the CO2 bottle. The aircraft you will be flying will have two different V-speeds for the operation of your landing gear, VLO and VLE. VLO is your maximum indicated airspeed for operating your landing gear. VLE is your maximum airspeed for flight with your landing gear extended. So what is the difference? As I said, VLO is the maximum speed that you can operate the landing gear while in flight. One of the main reasons for this is that when the gear is in operation, either retraction or extension, your gear doors are moving in different configurations, and the airspeed restriction is so they do not get damaged in transit. Other reasons include the pressures exerted on the gear itself as it is operated and transitioning into a down and locked or an up and locked status. Some engineer somewhere determined exactly how much stress the gear and the doors could take and through testing made a determination as to what that airspeed should be. Some aircraft have two different VLO speeds, one for retraction and the other for extension. Learn these speeds for every aircraft you fly. Once the gear is down and locked, things are often more streamlined and stable, sometimes allowing a faster airspeed for your VLE, or the maximum airspeed you can fly, when the gear is extended but not being operated. Airplanes also have certain safety features to remind us to get the gear down. Normally, anytime you reduce the power beyond a certain setting, the airplane is figuring that you are landing and if the gear is not down and locked, you will hear an audible horn warning you of this unsafe condition. One other popular safety device has to do with the flaps. If you extend your flaps into the landing configuration without the gear down and locked, you will again hear that horn. Lights will always be part of your system also. Some airplanes have gear unsafe warning lights, some gear in transit, some a light for up and locked, but all have either one or three green lights to show the gear down and locked. Why one or three? In aircraft where the landing gear is interlinked, in other words, all connected to each other, where you are either up or down as a whole, you will have one light. When the gear are all separate, you will have three lights to show each individual gear is down and locked. Also take note that your gear handle is always shaped like a wheel. This way you can differentiate your flap handle and your gear handle because your flap handle is always shaped like an airfoil or it is a lever as in the PA-28 series in the Pipers and many other aircraft. 
There are also safety devices to keep you from retracting the gear on the ground. This is typically a squat switch on your landing gear that opens the circuit when the squat switch senses that you have weight on your wheels. In any regards, there are many different types of landing gear as well as emergency procedures for gear operation. More than I can possibly cover in this video. You will learn the type of landing gear you will have in any new aircraft you will train in. It is very important to understand what it is and exactly how it operates, as well as your emergency procedures. Flap operation and systems is another item you should know very well for the airplane you will be flying. How do they operate? What type of flaps are they and when should you use them? Most airplanes require a flap setting for takeoff, but some restrict it. The 300 series and some of the 400 series Cessnas, for instance, have split flaps. The use of these split flaps is prohibited for takeoff. Typically, there is no emergency extension of flaps and you will need to know how to land without them. Can the airplane you fly have an asymmetrical flap deployment? In other words, can one flap come down and the other one not? This situation will cause an adverse roll that sometimes may not be overcome by the use of ailerons. Is there a mechanism to prevent that situation? What can be done about it if it happens? Again, I will leave this to your training on the individual aircraft you will be training in, as each one is different. As with the many different types of landing gear comes a wide variety of propellers. From a fixed pitch, to a variable pitch, two-bladed, three-bladed, feathering props with and without full reverse, props on light twins that may or may not have reverse but must be fully feathering, right into very complex. Now let's cover the prop governor and its operation as it pertains to the pilot, its automatic functions and exactly how it operates the prop. While there are still a variety of prop governors, they all have the same basic operation. The pilot's control of the prop is often greatly misunderstood by many who are in the early stages of their training using a variable pitch propeller, and I would like to spend some more time showing the general operation of the prop control. Let's dive into this subject and get an understanding of exactly what is happening to your propeller and your governor while you fly. The prop governor is a direct engine driven device that supplies regulated oil pressure to the propeller that will determine its pitch for any given phase of flight. It is usually controlled by the pilot with the propeller control inside the cockpit. Some aircraft fully automate this function while turboprop engines have slightly different controls, but everything still operates in like fashion. The basic components consist of the drive shaft that drives the governor directly by the engine, the control lever that is linked to the propeller control in the cockpit, the control speed rack, the return spring that assists in returning the governor to a finer pitch, the speeder spring that provides the tension to operate the pilot valve, the pilot valve that controls where the oil for the prop pitch is being distributed, Flyweights that operate the pilot valve using centrifugal force based on the RPM of the engine, and the oil boost pump that increases the engine oil pressure to a value that can operate the propeller pitch. So let's look at how all this works. An airplane with a fixed pitch propeller I often describe as riding a single speed bike. Those days as a kid you would ride your single speed bike on level ground, you would pedal that bike as fast as you can go and achieve a certain result. When you would have to start climbing a hill, what would happen? Gravity would be against you and despite all your best efforts, your pedaling would slow down as would your speed. Once you crest that hill and started back down, your pedaling would speed up and your bike would go faster. With a fixed pitch prop, just like that single speed bike, when you are in straight and level flight, you set the engine power based on your RPM and you get a certain speed along with a stabilized engine RPM. When you begin a climb from straight and level flight, gravity exerts itself. There is more resistance against the propeller and your engine slows down with the increased workload. In turn, when you begin a descent, gravity is now helping you. 
There is less of a strain on the prop and the engine RPM will show an increase as your airspeed increases. With a variable pitch propeller, you can think more about your 10-speed bike. On level ground, you start out in a low gear and then as you speed up, you shift into higher gears as the resistance dissipates. Your rate of pedaling, or RPM, remains fairly constant, yet the gearing makes you move faster. When you start up that same hill, you have to shift into a lower gear that helps you to maintain your same rate of pedaling, even though your speed decreases. Your power will increase to make it up that hill, but your speed will be reduced. On the downhill side, your pedaling wants to speed back up, so you shift into a higher gear to keep it constant. Your speed increases and with a higher gear you are taking a bigger bite out of your gear ratio. Your variable pitch propeller works much like this, but the prop governor makes this process automatic. In reality, your prop governor is an automatic hydrostatic transmission for your propeller. You set the propeller with your prop lever using the engine RPM as a guide and the governor will do the rest. It controls engine RPM by increasing or decreasing the pitch of the prop, which in turn increases or decreases the resistance on the engine, much like a gear ratio in a transmission would. In exchange for this, the more coarse pitch takes a much bigger bite out of the air, which will increase your speed, while a much finer pitch will give you less speed but increased power. The manifold pressure is the atmospheric pressure entering the engine intake. The manifold pressure gauge will show atmospheric pressure when the engine is not running. Once the engine is started, the manifold pressure will read much lower due to the engine intake being restricted by the lower throttle setting as well as the vacuum of the engine. When the throttle is full open, it will be showing the full atmospheric pressure being introduced into the intake. If you have a turbocharged airplane, the manifold pressure will be increased beyond the outside air pressure due to the compression of the air introduced into the intake by the turbocharger. Now let's take flight in a Piper Aero to see how this thing actually works. Startup is pretty much the norm for what you are used to. The before takeoff checklist will consist of the same items you check in a fixed pitch propeller airplane. What is new on the before takeoff ground check run up is exercising the prop. In doing so, you will ensure that the prop governor works properly and warm up the oil that actuates the pitch of the propeller. When doing this, pull the prop lever back three times. The three things you are looking for is a reduction in engine RPM, a rise in the manifold pressure, and a slight increase in engine oil pressure. What is happening when you do this is the prop governor is calling for a decreased RPM. In doing so, oil pressure is introduced into the hub of the propeller, causing the pitch of the propeller to increase. This action takes a much bigger bite out of the air, and the strain on the engine causes the decreased RPM. On takeoff, the prop and mixture controls will be full forward and your throttle to take off power. In a normally aspirated aircraft, this will mean full throttle, and in a turbocharged or turbine aircraft, this will mean whatever the airplane calls for that will not overboost the engine. We will look at a turbocharged aero later, but for now we will focus on a normally aspirated or non-turbocharged aero. Takeoff will not be much different from what you are used to. Rotate at VR and set your climb attitude for your climb speed. There are two schools of thought on when to retract the landing gear. One, when you have a positive rate of climb, the gear comes up. The second being that you can no longer land on the runway remaining in the case that your engine quits, you can then raise the landing gear. In this single engine airplane, we will use the latter. So, out of usable runway, you retract the landing gear. At 500 feet AGL, fuel pump and landing light off, flaps up, and set your RPM for climb. 
In this case, we will use 2500 RPM. Notice that the RPM will now remain constant regardless of any change in pitch attitude. Also note that as you climb, the manifold pressure drops. Remember that manifold pressure is based on the atmospheric pressure entering the engine. For every thousand feet you climb, you lose one inch of mercury of air pressure. So, in a normally aspirated airplane, you will lose one inch of manifold pressure for every thousand feet. Transitioning into cruise flight, you will once again set your power. Pull back on that prop lever a bit more and set your engine RPM to 2400. Another school of thought we can discuss here is to never run the engine over squared. What this means is to never have the manifold pressure exceed your engine RPM. Is this right or wrong? This is a concept that I was taught in the beginning and that I did follow for quite some time until I saw some pilots not following that rule of thumb. Then it dawned on me that in a turbocharged airplane you are always running a higher manifold pressure than your RPM, so what could it possibly hurt in a normally aspirated airplane? Now I take what I can get for power. It really has no adverse effect on the engine. So think back to that 172 we were just flying and remember that when we went into a climb, the engine RPM slowed down on its own. Watch what happens in our arrow. When we pull back on the stick, the engine RPM remains the same. This is the prop governor in action. Here is how this works. Remember those flyweights we looked at on the cutaway view of the prop governor? They are stabilized by the pressure of the speeder spring tension that you set with the prop lever that is connected to the speed control shaft. As the engine tries to slow down due to the greater strain caused by the climb, the flyweights that are spinning with the engine RPM begin to sense an underspeed condition, and in the reduction of the centrifugal force being exerted on them, they can no longer maintain their position. The flyweights fold in under the pressure of the speeder spring, and in turn that will push the pilot valve down, which reduces the oil pressure in the propeller hub that was causing your prop to be in a more coarse pitch. Oil from the prop hub is pushed out and back into the engine by the spring or other such device in the hub that causes the propeller to go into a finer pitch. This reduces the resistance on the prop and it keeps the RPM set for the airplane. Basically, you are shifting into a lower gear. You now have the power to keep the engine at your selected RPM, but your speed is reduced as you take less of a bite out of the air with the finer pitch in the prop. There is a bypass valve that opens allowing for the high pressure oil coming from the governor boost pump to recirculate. Conversely, when we take the airplane into a dive, that resistance diminishes on the prop. The governor senses an overspeed situation by the flyweights that are spreading out due to the added centrifugal force. This action then lifts the pilot valve, allowing the high pressure oil to enter into the propeller hub and increase the pitch on the prop, which in turn adds resistance. Again, the governor is keeping the engine RPM at a constant speed. One thing to keep in mind here is when you are in a descent that the propeller will increase in pitch as the resistance on it diminishes. This causes it to take a much bigger bite out of the air. Much like going downhill on your 10-speed bike, you shift that sucker into 10th gear and it really gets rolling. The airplane performance is greatly increased and your speed will increase far more than it would in an airplane with a fixed pitch propeller. In straight and level, unaccelerated flight, the governor will be in an on-speed condition. The flyweights are in a straight-up configuration, the pilot valve is closed off for both the oil entering and exiting the hub, and everything stays in a state of equilibrium. Meanwhile, that high-pressure oil created by the boost pump in the governor is again being bypassed. Coming in for a landing, you should be stabilized with your power set. In this airplane, we will use 15 inches of manifold pressure. In the arrow, I like to turn on the auxiliary fuel pump and the landing light when I receive my landing clearance. At the top of your descent on final approach, or the top of your glide path, 
In a complex aircraft, you will first drop the landing gear. Push the prop full forward and add flaps a notch. Each of these items are drag devices. Do not touch the power. Just let the nose come down due to the new configuration and the drag devices will start your descent without reducing power. Immediately go to your gear lights and see that you have three or one green lights illuminated. I call it out audibly, three green, down and locked. Some people will keep their hand on the gear handle until those lights come on, but I prefer to get everything done then go back to the lights as a final step. For me, it keeps things flowing better. Rather than just dropping the gear and waiting, by the time I have the flaps down, the gear is either down or shortly will be. There are some other variations to this, but this will be our procedure here with the arrow. Small power adjustments can be made for corrections in altitude if necessary, but get back to that stabilized power when the correction is through. Before you mess around with the power, check your airspeed. In this case, we are a little low, so I will add some power, but if our airspeed is high, it just may be because we went into a steeper approach and descended too quickly. If the airspeed is high, just trim back a bit and use the yoke to get back on your glide path. At 500 feet AGL, I add the second notch of flaps or 25 degrees. This will slow you down for the approach. Each and every time I touch the flaps, I recheck my landing gear lights. By the time I have landed, I have checked to ensure that my landing gear is down and locked four times. When the runway is made, I will lower the flaps to landing, typically at around 100 feet, and check the gear lights. This will slow you down the rest of the way for your landing before you pull your power out the rest of the way. Over the threshold, power comes out, or in some aircraft, comes down to a determined setting. Right as I am about to flare, I take one last glance at the lights and land. Now let's take a quick look at the turbocharged arrow. What exactly is a turbocharger? Simply put, a turbocharger uses exhaust gases from the engine to spin a turbine that in turn drives another turbine that provides pressurized air into the intake. This greatly increased air pressure allows the engine to run at a much higher manifold pressure and helps you to maintain that pressure as you climb, also allowing you to climb to a much higher altitude. A good turbocharger can maintain 30 inches of manifold pressure all the way up into the flight levels before it starts dropping off. Most general aviation aircraft have a maximum boost of 40 to 46 inches. Some turbochargers have automatic waste gates that prevent an overboosting situation. Some have manual waste gates. The waste gate will open or be opened and will vent off the excess boost to the atmosphere. Our Piper Arrow has no waste gate, but it does have a caution light that is telling us when we are overboosting the engine. The only drawbacks to a turbocharged engine is that the time required for your scheduled engine overhaul is significantly reduced. And on descent, it is best to slowly reduce the power just one inch every minute until you have reached 20 inches to prevent shock cooling. This takes some serious pre-planning for your descent from altitude, especially the altitudes that you can fly with a turbocharger. If you are going to fly high, remember your oxygen rules. Everything including run-up is the same, but on takeoff you need to watch your power to ensure that you are not overboosting the engine. Essentially, overboosting can destroy your engine. Turbochargers may also be used to pressurize the cabin. Now let's look at twin-engine aircraft. In the single-engine, piston airplane, your prop governor increases the pitch of your propeller by increasing the oil pressure to the hub of the prop. In case of a loss of oil pressure, if your engine quit, for instance, your propeller would automatically go into a fine pitch. Turboprop engines and all twin-engine aircraft operate much the same, but are actually opposite on how the governor controls the prop. 
In one of these aircraft, added oil pressure decreases the pitch of the propeller. If you lose oil pressure, the propeller will automatically go into a feathered situation. This is very important because if you lose an engine in a twin, you will need to get the prop feathered in order to reduce the drag that the inoperative engine is causing. The worst thing for your performance of a light twin with one engine inoperative is a wind milling propeller. The drag it causes is severe. The governor on these twins have a feathering valve, so when you pull your prop lever all the way back into the feather position, that valve opens and rapidly drains all oil pressure from the hub of the prop. A force in the hub will then bring the propeller into a feathered condition. That force may be a nitrogen charge in the front of the hub, a large spring much like you see in the single engine aircraft, but again in the front of the hub, or counterweights to assist, or a combination of these. If the engine seizes, the prop will automatically go into feather. But an engine that simply loses power may be kept spinning due to the airflow over the propeller, which will keep it from feathering. When you are on the ground and you shut down a twin, the prop should not go into feather. Why? These propellers will have stop locks that engage the prop at a low RPM. At this low RPM, you are no longer in prop governing mode, so the blades are at their finest pitch. These stop locks are spring-loaded to engage the prop, but with a faster RPM, the centrifugal force acting on these locks prevent them from locking the prop so it can move freely in flight. You will learn more about this when you get into your multi-engine rating. Earlier, I discussed the two rules of thought as to when to retract the landing gear. In a twin, I like to get the gear up as soon as I have a positive rate of climb. The reason for this is that the gear also creates a great deal of drag. If I lost an engine right after takeoff, I would want as little drag as possible to climb on that one engine so I can safely return to the airport. If your gear is still down, your twin may have a difficult time climbing out to return to the airport safely. In the case of an Aztec, for instance, with a single hydraulic pump on the left engine to operate the gear, if you lost that left engine, you lose the hydraulic pump. You will still be able to extend the gear manually, but you cannot retract the gear. It is best to get the gear up as soon as safety allows. When flying complex aircraft, it is best to learn to fly by the numbers. What I mean by that is, know your power settings and airspeeds you achieve in the various flight conditions and configurations. The more complex the aircraft, the more important this is. Using stabilized power settings, not jockeying around with the power and trim so much, will let you know in short order if something is not right. It will also make for a smoother flight and you will look much more professional as a pilot. This goes hand in hand with your flight profile that should be developed and consistent for each individual airplane that you fly. I have a specific power setting and configuration that I use for each position from my final descent right down to the runway. Strong winds or high density altitude days may vary this slightly, as will ATC bringing me into high that necessitates a more rapid descent to my final. These variations are typically minimal. I make a power setting change for instance, but I do not make extreme changes where I would start over controlling and find myself being a throttle jockey, constantly moving the power around. Stabilizing your settings will allow you to pay attention to flying the aircraft and those all-important precision approaches that can be so demanding. Again, know a flight profile for each airplane you will be flying. Know your numbers. If your power settings are where they should be, for example, and your airspeed is much faster than it should be while on your final descent, you probably forgot to bring the gear down. Know your numbers and have a flow that remains constant for each airplane you fly and learn to stabilize your approaches. I have been using the term variable pitch propeller a lot here and not constant speed engine. The reason being that when you reduce power in a reciprocating engine aircraft, at some point you will drop out of what is known as the prop governing mode and your throttle controls RPM while the prop stays at its finest pitch. The conquest here is an actual constant speed setup. A turbine engine must maintain a certain speed in order to keep running. 
At 100% RPM, the engine is running in excess of 41,000 RPM, and the prop is spinning at only 2,000 RPM. This engine is not self-sustaining until it reaches 60%. It has three settings for the condition levers for normal operation. You begin with the start and taxi position. When you push forward on the power levers, the RPM does not change. Your governors simply increase the pitch of the props, producing more torque. In this airplane, RPM is read as a percentage, and you will typically be right around 70 to 75% with this setting. On takeoff, you move the condition levers full forward into the takeoff mode. This will put your engines at 100% RPM. And again, only the pitch of the prop is changing to a coarser pitch as you move the power levers forward, giving you a great deal of torque. In flight, you will bring the condition levers back to 96%. The position of the power levers have no effect on engine RPM, thus making it an actual constant speed engine. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. My continuing to put the hundreds of hours to create these videos is dependent on my number of subscribers and the hours watched. I produce these videos at no charge to you, which means unless I have a following, I make nothing for my effort. Subscribing is easy and it is free, and if you opt for it, you will see every time I introduce a new video. Thanks for watching. Fly safe and enjoy each and every new airplane you get to experience.